we conceived of this meeting a um, long time ago. And then just last week, I got a reminder email about it. And I read the points, you know, what we wanted to discuss. And I thought, wait a minute, something's missing here. We should have a presenter. And boom, Dwayne Elgin naturally came to mind. Um, you know, Dwayne and I have known each other for quite a while. I, he was on Buddha at the Gas Pump and I've stayed in touch with his work. Um, and he's, he's written a new book, which I absolutely love called Choosing Earth. I haven't even finished it because as soon as I started reading it, I thought, oh, I've got to interview him again. And I don't want to finish this book until right before I interview him, uh, but it's great. And uh, let me just read a little bio of his uh, and then um, we'll get right into it. And he, he's, uh, he also has a, a, a movie that he has made, which includes Victoria Santos, who will be our next presenter in July, but we'll talk more about that later. So here's Dwayne's bio. So Dwayne Elgin is an interna internationally recognized speaker, author, and social visionary who looks beneath the surface turbulence of our times to explore the deeper trends that are transforming our world. In 2006, Duane received the International Goy Peace Award in Japan in recognition of his contribution to a global, quote, vision, consciousness, and lifestyle, end quote, that fosters a more sustainable and spiritual culture. His books include The Living Universe, Where Are We, Who Are We, Where Are We Going, 2009, Promise Ahead, A Vision of Hope and Action for Humanity's Future, 2000. Voluntary Simplicity, Toward a Way of Life that is Outwardly Simple, Inwardly Rich, uh, 2010, 93, and 81. And Awakening Earth, the book I just held up, Exploring the Evolution of Human Culture and Consciousness, 1993. With Joseph Campbell and other scholars, he co-authored the book Changing Images of Man in 1982. In addition, Duane has contributed chapters to 22 books and has published more than 100 major articles and blog posts. And he has a couple of different websites which we'll post in the show notes. So welcome, Duane, and thank you so much for doing this on short notice. My pleasure, Rick. What a wonderful community uh, you've gathered here. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, so... To begin, I'd like to ask my wife, who's sitting right here, Colleen, I'd like her to scoot her chair over. There we go. And she's, in this household, Colleen is the techie. She knows how these things work. They do. There. <laughs> so um, Colleen's going to run um, and play two short videos. Um, and the first, Okay, so it's is. a clip from the documentary, um, Facing Adversity, Choosing Earth, Choosing Life, which uh, we produced, co-produced in April of this year, and it's just starting to get out into the world. So we're going to show you a short clip, and you'll get to see Victoria in that clip. She's in there, too. Great turning which is what? It's a transition we're in. We're in it now. It's a transition. We're learning so much in science and in grassroots community building. It's not something we do instead of the collapse. It's something that can guide us through it. My preposition these days is through. Honey, we're gonna to have to go through this. The opportunity of this time is for us to evaluate and reassess our priorities as a species. We need to look at what our relationships are to each other, to our families, to our community, and really assess our values. We've arrived at a species level conversation, our species, and we need to own this to find a path forward. We have entered an extraordinarily rare moment in humanity's collective journey. The path for generations to come will depend on people alive today. We cannot predict where humanity will go from here for one simple reason. Our future depends on our individual and collective consciousness and the choices that emerge from that consciousness. 
So um, to set the stage for this, mm -hmm. let's play that other the next video. You want to go right through them? Oh, okay. Sure, sure. let's do two short videos to set the stage. There are three words that really summarize what I would like to talk about here today. Uh, reality, identity, and journey. So the first thing, uh, I know that separation was a key theme of uh, today's conversation. So the first thing I want to talk about is the nature of reality. And then given that understanding of the nature of reality, I want to speak then about the, the uh, what it means for human identity. Who are we as a species? And thirdly, given a, a foundation in reality and a sense of our emerging identity, what is the journey that we're on? So those are the three key words, reality, identity, and journey, uh, that really summarize the, the uh, conversation here today. So to begin, I'd like to ask Colleen to play another short clip that really gets to the heart of uh, how we uh, regard the nature of reality. Have you ever had the experience of seeing a delicate aliveness in the world? Have you ever looked at a flower or the space around you and seen a subtle glow a luminosity and felt a deep kinship with all of existence? Have you ever experienced a feeling of oneness with the world around you, a feeling of communion with the whole universe? Many people assume that we live in a universe comprised of dead matter and empty space. And this is truly a dark, night of the soul if that is the kind of world that we inhabit. Fortunately, ancient wisdom and modern science are coming together and they're revealing the universe in a new way. Instead of dead at the foundation, it is increasingly viewed as a living system in its totality. And certainly at the foundation of all humanity and all of our lives and our life experience is the direct experience of being alive. And it is this experience of profound aliveness that we share with all creatures and all humans. Sometimes I will say to nature, surprise me. And within a few moments, I will see the flight of a bee, the architecture of a flower, there is an astonishing degree of beauty and design in nature's creations. All right, thank you so much. I couldn't have done that without Colleen's able support. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have, um, three conversations, if you will, uh, about the nature of reality, identity, and then humanity's journey. And one way to set the stage for that is to go to the wisdom of um, the world's uh, indigenous traditions. And, and from those traditions, uh, we gather the idea that there are three miracles in life. And the first miracle is that anything exists at all, that anything exists at all as a first miracle. The second miracle is that living things exist, plants, animals, and such uh, that surround us in the larger ecology. And the third miracle is that living things exist that know they exist, and that tends to be ourselves. Now, <clears throat> we tend to take the first miracle as the primary miracle and focus on, well, aren't we amazing? We know that we're here. We know that we exist. And in focusing on that third miracle of our own consciousness, our own existence, we tend to forget the other two miracles and in particular, the first miracle that anything is here at all. So let's take just a few minutes 
speak about the nature of reality, that anything is here at all, and, um, and then have a brief conversation and we'll then move on to the next two, uh, the sense of identity and humanity's evolutionary journey. So reality, we've assumed for the last few hundred years in the modern materialistic paradigm that reality is essentially non-living at the foundations, dead at the foundations, if you will. Um, it's rather graphic, but nonetheless descriptive. Um, so is reality essentially dead at the foundations? And essentially there's just these few islands of aliveness uh, ourselves. Uh, and the consciousness then is a function of activity in the human physical brain. So, um, I had an opportunity to explore the nature of reality, but this gets into the quantum nature of uh, physics, the quantum nature of the universe seen through, through the lens of physics. And now quantum theory begins to say reality is not divided into separate chunks and pieces and islands. It is rather an undivided whole. And we're a part of that undivided wholeness. And physics, physics is now saying reality is not primarily material. Indeed, 95% of the known universe is non-material. It's dark matter, dark energy. We don't really know what that means. But when we say it's dark, it means we can't penetrate into it to see into it, to understand and know what it is. So dark matter is essentially a contractive force in the universe. Dark energy is an expansive force. And here we are on this thin veneer, the 5% of material reality that is visible, that is knowable through our ordinary senses. And we take that as the totality, but in fact, it is not. And that larger totality is a unified whole. So there is no foundational separation in the universe. We're a part of, an in, of a seamless whole. Now, I'll mention something that I have sel seldom spoken about in the last, I don't know, 40 some years of my life, almost 50. Uh, and that is um, my experience at the Stanford Research Institute in the earliest experiments they did in parapsychology. And the experiments there uh, focused initially on remote viewing, seeing at a distance. And they, they worked with uh, roughly 2,000 people to find a, a, a four people to work with over the next three years. Um, and I was one of those four. A remarkable opportunity to explore the nature of consciousness and whether we're really separate or a part of a seamless whole. And I'll just say this, that... Um, based upon nearly three years of experiments, uh, working with the uh, NASA team and those there at the Stanford Research Institute. I would go into the laboratory setting and oftentimes three days a week for three hours or so at a time, I would explore the ecology of consciousness. And I was curious, I did not go into this presuming that uh, we were there, we were connected. I didn't know. I was curious to find out. So I participated in all kinds of experiments there at the uh, at this think tank, and gradually over time, um, I confronted my own prejudice that I was just this physical body separate from everything else, and it was fantasy that uh, we were deeply foundationally connected. But in fact, I was, I was confronting myself and confronting the limitations of my own sense of uh, life and reality. And what I discovered again and again and again with scientific feedback all the time, feedback, 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 um, was that no, um, I am subtly and profoundly connected with all uh, that exists. So, um, there is, is the first uh, piece of this. Uh, what is the nature of reality? Well, it's a unified whole. 
But additionally, there's another element to reality, uh, the nature of the universe that is integral to our understanding. It's not only unified, it's regenerative. The universe is a regenerative system. And the speed of regeneration is essentially at speed of light. Uh, you, all of us, the entire universe is emerging moment by moment by moment uh, as a continuous flow, uh, essentially at the speed of light. The Buddha spoke of reality. Well, it's like a flash of lightning. Uh, it just is here and it's gone. Here it's gone. Here and it's gone. But it happens so fast that we tend to merge that continual regenerative process into a seamless uh, whole. Just like when we go to the movie at 30 frames a second, uh, our visual field goes from a series of frames and into a seamless uh, flow. And so reality is, is like that. It's unified and it's regenerative, emerging as a seamless whole. And because of that nature, we can reach beneath the uh, 5% uh, the, that we see and into the 95% that is not physically perceptible, but knowable through our intuitive capacities. And in reaching underneath the 5% to the knowable uh, reaches, realms, we can then begin to participate in the world with our intuitive capacity in a way that we, uh, it's just stunning, it's surprising. Now, Importantly, uh, all of us are connected to the living universe. We're all connected. So this isn't anything special. There is a literacy of consciousness that we can acquire. Uh, if, if anyone on this call had access to the same kind of instrumentations in a laboratory with feedback that I had over those three years, you'd gradually learn, oh, yes, we, we, there is a literacy of consciousness. We do know how we connect, both receiving information as well as extending information out into the world. We'll spend a dozen years getting a high school degree in that literacy of, uh, of an analytical way of knowing the world and never spend time really discovering the literacy of consciousness, the intuitive realms. So give us a dozen years to explore those realms as well. And we would find uh, I, just stunning insights about the seamless web in which we exist. The separation is a fantasy, it's not foundational. And uh, it's something that we project into the world uh, with our uh, collective imagination. So enough said, uh, your turn to comment and offer uh, any questions before we go on to the next uh, part of the conversation. And uh, I'm gonna turn to Rick and see if he would facilitate uh, this part of the conversation. I had myself muted. I think people can just unmute themselves. And we have so few enough people here that I don't think we'll all speak at once. So if someone, if someone has a question or comment, they could just unmute themselves and, and say it. Uh, Not everyone at once. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to affirm the importance of this work and the question was put forward if any of you had connections with this sort of work and my mother was part of the J.B. Vrine work in the 1930s so I was reared with the baseline understanding that we're all connected that we do communicate in and we do communicate out across great distances so yeah nothing but applause and appreciation for your great. work. Thank you Christopher. Ooh. Hi there, uh, my name's Annie, hi, and Annie. I just hi Dwayne. I just happened to read recently about Jean Houston and how she met Teilhard de Chardin when she was just <laughs> 11, 12 years old, and she didn't realize. She thought she called him Mr. Teilhard. She met him in Central Park when he was a Jesuit priest there, um, and they used to take walks. And she was very upset because her parents had divorced, and this was very consoling for her. And she remarked about on on the impact he had on her about how he could see the vibrancy and everything, you know, and he would be in a state of wonder. 
And she took this in as a young girl. And then subsequently she found out that he was this great being, you know, Teilhard de Chardin, and he died on Easter Sunday. Uh, but he was not accepted by the church apparently. And the only reason I bring this up is because it's interesting, I read this yesterday and it seems very much in keeping with what you're describing, the literacy of, of, of the universe right. and of consciousness. So right. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Annie. It really goes back to the first miracle uh, that anything exists at all. What, what is the nature of existence that it blossomed from a, a pinpoint of energy 13.8 billion years ago and now there are over 200 trillion galaxies, estimates, over 200 trillion galaxies. What a miracle of creation. Uh, the first miracle is an stunning, astonishing miracle of creation. And we tend to disregard it, tend to not even think about it, uh, not recognize the existence of this miracle in our lives. So what we're doing right now and what you said, Annie, is we're reclaiming. Uh, that miracle and bringing it into the uh, into our the presence in our lives and in that process we can then begin to re-understand our sense of identity uh, and who we are so who else um, I have a quick one um, in about a month I'm going to interview a guy named um, Stephen C. Meyer and he's a proponent of intelligent design and I had always been leery of that term because I associated it with fundamentalist Christians trying to get, you know, the Bible into schools or, and, and there's, there's sort of a cultural um, disapproval of, of that notion, but, but then we live in a materialist culture. And in fact, I looked him up on uh, Wikipedia and they, Wikipedia tends to have a very materialist ed editorial board and they slam people like Rupert Sheldrake and all, and they, don't, they didn't treat Stephen Meyer very kindly, but, you know, from, everything I've read of him so far and listened to, I agree with him entirely. I mean, <laughs> the universe is just this massive intelligence that's, on the, and there's so many things in it that could not possibly be random or accidental. Um, so it's interesting. I, I think I'm a proponent of intelligent design all of a sudden. Uh, so anyway, what do you think about that? Uh, I'll learn more about his work, you know, as I approach the interview and do it with him. And maybe I'll find some aspects of it that I, I don't agree with. But so far, it, it concurs with the way I've been thinking about things. Yeah, I, I really agree with you, Rick, that um, we need to reclaim intelligent design as a as an window for looking at the world. Um, and as I mentioned in that video, sometimes I'll walk along and, and I'll be feeling disconnected from the universe and all the rest. And I'll say, surprise me, challenging the universe. And literally each time I do that, within a few steps, I'm looking at something that I did not expect. And it is uh, su surprising me with the intelligence of the design. Uh, flowers, for example, extraordinary. How in the world do these little beings decide to invent themselves with a with extraordinary range of structure uh, that they do? And that same uh, insight applies to the entire uh, universe. Uh, one amazing thing uh, about uh, the nature of design, we look out at the universe and we look out at the idea that there are 200 trillion galaxies and the universe out there looks immensely large. And, and indeed it is. And so then we say, well, look, we're just these little tiny beings and this large immensity. Who are we? We're just little small creatures <clears throat> in the larger scope of things. But if you had a ruler that went to the larger scale of the known universe out to those 200 trillion galaxies, and it went down to the smallest scale in the known universe, we are roughly in the middle. We're actually a little bit on the big side, which means that there is more, this is the key thing, there is more smallness within us than there is bigness beyond us. We're giants in the actual scale and structure of the universe. There's more, more smallness inside of us than there is bigness beyond us. 
to me, that's a, that's a stunning insight. So here we are giants. And as giants, we tend to overlook the design structures of the larger universe and what Rick was speaking about. And it isn't simply the uh, the uh, design of the universe, it is the uh, beauty of that design uh, and how that beauty reflects back to us the miracle of creation itself. So thanks, Rick. Here's a quick little factoid that I was uh, that I often ponder when considering the point you just made. If you if you take a gram of hydrogen and make all the atoms in it the size of unpopped popcorn kernels, you would cover the continental United States nine miles deep with uncooked popcorn. That's how many atoms there are in a gram of hydrogen. And when you consider that each one of those little atoms is just this sort of perfectly orderly marvel that we hardly understand. And then you can then you extend it out to the whole universe and consider how, <laughs> you know, from the, how, how incredibly complex and vast the whole thing is, and then consider the impossibility of it actually being accidental or random. I mean, I just kind of go through that little thought train every now and then to wake my brain up. <laughs> Wonderful example. Thank you. Dwayne, what my, what my brain does uh, in interpreting what you said about surprise me, when you say that to the universe, surprise mm -hmm. me. How I hear it is that it's a dissolving of our own limitations. It's like, okay, I, my limited perception suspended, suspended. And it's like, it's like what happens when we're curious. It's, there's something that breaks it out. And then it's such a paradox because, you know, in certain groups of spiritual leadership, that limitation has come back in that it's only about achieving this stateless state. It's only about stepping out and realizing, you know, um, that, that there is nothing or yes. that there's only emptiness or that, you know, that this isn't real or whatever the flavor is in terms of the teachings. Um, and it's ironic because actually a limitation has come in that has um, denied the, the curiosity aspect of our humanness. And that has put in place a more sophisticated and subtle limitation of how we perceive the beauty of that interconnectedness. It's like we've sacrificed the detail of the interconnectedness for this, you know, maybe hierarchical or this other position that, that we've, we've traded out and the inclusivity is gone, which is extraordinary because this great transition is about inclusivity. It's about, releasing the limitations, but in a very um, holistic, wholesome way. Yes, we're going to get more to that, Jack, but thank you so much for that uh, reflection. Who else? I'd just like to say that um, uh, the rather provincial word Ecumenism comes to mind here, uh, to me, um, that this actually widens the oikos, the, the, the home to which we belong infinitely in all directions. And it um, blows apart any, any um, attempt at spirituality to something completely different in, in, in my experience. Uh, there's this terrible tension between being this particular spot in the universe here and then being awake to the whole gamut of what's going on. I don't know, I'm blown away. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's move on. We'll come back around to these themes. Uh, <coughs> Dwayne, I think as... John Koig has a comment. He just, oh, unmuted. okay. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I didn't, but since you, um, you mentioned, it, it just occurred to me, Duane, I mean, your talk was really beautiful and your, your enthusiasm, just even the flushed face and everything, it's, it's very, very infectious. So thank you. You've obviously dedicated a whole life to this. It's quite beautiful. And in terms of um, what you immediately did was bring everything down to the wholeness of things. And then as Rick brought up this whole idea of, of um, will surprise me, surprise with the design. 
I, I was wondering if you had ever looked to the Vedas because um, I think a number of us come from a tradition that's basically Vedic. And that seems to me, and in, in my experience, also spending a life of basically interest in this one thing, who are we? That seems to be where not only the design is described, but how the design comes out of consciousness in the first place. And I wondered if you had ever looked in that direction. I assume you probably have. You're in quantum physics. and Yes. Thank you, John. Good segue. Thank you. Good help. <laughs> Who are we? Uh, you know, what, I mean, if you look beneath the surface structures, um, who are we? And um, I've written a book. Let me grab a copy here. Uh, another book. No, I don't. There it is. The Living Universe. Um, and I, I spent, oh, probably 30 years writing this one book. And just, you talk about the Vedas and these other spiritual traditions. Yes, I've looked at that. Um, and if the universe is alive, we're a part of that larger aliveness. Uh, so who are we? What are we if we, we look beneath the surface structures of uh, society and culture? Uh, who are we? What are we? And so this easily could take the hour all by itself. Uh, but four themes come up again and again across the world's wisdom traditions uh, about the nature of who we are. And essentially, uh, they are that we're a body of light, love, music, and knowing. Light, love, music, and knowing. Uh, so we're a body of light. And uh, as you meet someone, uh, let's say, uh, encounter a friend and so on, uh, you see the light in their eyes. You feel the lightness uh, or not of their being. Um, when we talk about awakening, we talk about enlightenment uh, and on and on. So light is a foundational property of the universe. It's a foundational property of who we are. And it's not simply the physical light of existence. Light itself is a part of that enlightenment. So we're a body of light. We're a body of love. Every person that we meet has a quality uh, of, of compassion, of regard, of connection, of um, with, with, the, with the universe, with reality, and, and we can feel that, we can feel that. And that goes to the third quality, light, love, music. We're a body of resonance as well. Uh, and when we meet someone, we feel the love, the resonance that, the, that is the underlying nature of their being. And it just happens in an instant. In a, in a second, we can feel the light, the love, the music of their being, and we know that there is an intuitive capacity for knowing that we each have. And so as we walk around uh, meeting people, engaging with the universe, we're bringing a body of light, love, music, and knowing into our encounter uh, with others, uh, with ourselves, with reality. Uh, and that's the foundational nature of our being. And when the physical body dies, what's left? What's left when the physical body goes? Well, it's the body of light, love, music, and knowing. And that is the nature of the soul. That is the, uh, that is the nature of the being that, that endures. And so a key aphorism that I suggest is that all things end. All things end. All being continues. All things end, all being continues. And the being is that body of light, love, music, and knowing. So enough said, let me open it up again for, uh, for um, comments and questions uh, about the nature of our, the deeper nature of our identity. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Hi, it's Catherine. So Hi, um, it's been, my study uh, was in the subject of bliss for my doctorate degree and looking at like kind of consciousness being holographic. And um, so 
a couple of things I was thinking of here is like it's whole simultaneously and part of a larger whole with a kind of a spiral effect and that the more of us that are waking up and in terms of like an evolutionary um, spiral process, the more we're kind of turning, tuning into like a holosphere where it's even more inseparable. We can kind of connect with each other telepathically. The, the magic and mystery kind of returns in a way in a totally different experience of interconnection with wonder, but also grounded in science and more is included and transformed all in the now. And my mother passed away in December and I was so, she was very tied to Catholicism and yet we would meet as in Reiki and all these other alternative spiritual paths. And she was, you know, upset that I didn't remain Catholic. And as she passed, I have an ability to sort of connect with using intuitional senses of people who have passed. And so I felt her presence and there was this real powerful sense of an evolved spiritual, like a bodhisattva, which I was surprised by. Um, and she on and off has sent me these messages that the essence also remains of each individual unique being as part of the whole. So that when you do think of someone, is, which is also kind of in the holosphere, if, which is something I came up with, I think, but other people I'm sure have come up with something along the same lines. You can still connect with anyone in the past and in the future. And it's still, there's a kind of still a unique signature to her. So if, like, or you look at Ramana Maharshi's picture, how is it that still has, how is it he's still coming to people in their, in their dreams, you know? So there's some sort of still interesting, I think, or intriguing sense of how the uniqueness of each beingness can still be retained in the now while there's still also, um, a, a, a sort of beginning, middle, and end with the change. And I just find that all fascinating. I'm still incubating, obviously, about it all. But, you know, there, this idea of an essence that is timeless, but also has a uniqueness of the personhood that still can kind of be retained in the whole, even when the the body died. And I, I'm just throwing it out there because it was a very wild little insight that I had zero <laughs> expectation of I talk about a surprise I was like wow that's fabulous and so intriguing about how is it we could connect with people we love who have passed and it was another level of not even um I'm still missing the form of her but still feeling the inter the inseparability of of her with with me, you know, it's just so unique with mother and child anyway. So I just wanted to throw that out there because it was a little bit of a shock to me that that would be even possible. But I, it was very direct communication that I thought was extremely insightful and still something I'm playing around with. I'm sure that it, I don't know when the scientists will come around to discovering, <laughs> validating that. <laughs> so thanks Great. for letting me share that, but I thought it was intriguing. I, I like, Catherine, what you were saying, that uh, there was a unique signature right. uh, that you felt with your mother. And I would suggest that, uh, crudely stated, uh, she was a body of light, love, music, and knowing, and that's a unique constellation of qualities right. that were unique to your mother. Right. And, and, and they're unique to all of us. And as we evolve, and we're going to get into then what is the evolutionary journey? Right. Um, uh, let's see. Let's just speak about that. Time is moving on. Let's speak about that for um, uh, for a moment. What are we doing here anyway? Are, are <laughs> we are we here to just consume stuff for a while and then see the body die and that's the end of it all? Or is there a larger purpose and function to the nature of the universe itself? And I would suggest, building on what uh, Catherine was just saying, that, that we do each have this unique signature. The signature uh, can grow and evolve over time. Uh, we can evolve the light, the love, the music, knowing that we are 
uh, that doesn't e e exclude other qualities. That, that's just a crude foursome to help represent uh, in a transmaterial way who we are. So uh, what are we doing here? And, and if the universe is a living system in itself, which it, it absolutely appears to be, and we're alive, well, then our job is to grow into that larger aliveness with the unique signature, the unique essence that Catherine was speaking about, and have that continue to grow. And all things end, all material structures end, but all being, all essential qualities of light, love, music, and knowing continue. So our job, I feel, is uh, we're here in a learning environment. The universe is a learning system. And we're here in great freedom with the opportunity to learn about the nature of who we are in complete freedom. The universe doesn't impose that upon us. We get to discover it in freedom. And so in freedom, if we discover uh, I'm this body of of light, love, music, and knowing, well, then I have the freedom to then turn back with reflective consciousness upon myself and grow those qualities, qualities of being. So that is why I, I feel we're here, um, uh, to grow those qualities of being, not only individually, but given that it's a, it's a community of life to grow them in community with others. And so Catherine connects with her mother and wow, what an extraordinary being she is. Well, yes, it's a community of life and you're growing in that community. So um, it just all comes together in a, a wonderful, beautiful whole, it feels like to me. Comments? On the theme of climate change and uh, you know choosing Earth and where we're going uh, as a as a species, um, there's a graphic in your book. Well, well, firstly, that you know Joanna Macy in that clip was talking about moving through something, and I've always been kind of intrigued with where humanity is going. There've all all these ancient cultures have prophesy prophesized and predicted various outcomes, and many of those have come to pass but then that they don't take us all the way through the whole process. We're kind of in the middle of it. So there's a graphic in your book, which I'd like to share here, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, well, oh, there it is. Okay, here we go. So can you see that graphic? Yes. Okay, so that's in your book. And you're, you're kind of um, laying out three possible scenarios. Um, you know, one that we're just going to collapse into utter chaos and it'll extend well beyond the span of our lifetimes. Another is that, you know, we'll collapse and there will be some kind of authoritarian artificial intelligence dictatorship or something governing, like the whole world will become like China, only worse. And uh, then the third one is what I think many of us have hoped for, which is a kind of a great transition, which still involves a collapse because there's so much dominating our world that probably wouldn't exist very well in a more enlightened world, more enlightened society. But then out of that collapse will come a, an awakening and a, you know, a very bright future. So I wonder if you could comment on these possible scenarios. Sure. Um, why don't we just keep that up for a minute? Okay, so... I'll, I'll share it again, hang on. So Here people can orient around those three. Uh, first of all, the most important thing uh, is um, all three of these scenarios of the future, uh, crash and, coll and collapse, uh, the authoritarian outcome, uh, or trans transition and transformation. All three of them begin the same way. And they begin with where we are now, a time of great unraveling. And things are unraveling around us. And we can see that in many ways. Uh, is this going to accelerate and, and um, become more intense uh, in the decades ahead? Here, I, I suggest in the decade of the 2020s is the time of the great unraveling. Um, and things have to unravel, I think, before they can reconfigure themselves in a, in a new way. And so uh, there's huge amount of momentum coming into our times 
uh, around material growth uh, as the be all and end all of life. And that uh, mindset, that scenario, that paradigm of materialism is unraveling. And as things unravel enough, they won't hold together and there will be free fall. There will be a great time of great fall. And I think in the 2030s or thereabouts, there's no, uh, there's no necessary precision to this, but it's roughly the case, I think, uh, based upon decades of scholarship, by the way. Uh, so all three scenarios are going to go from a time of unraveling into a great fall and with that great sorrow. And the great sorrow is when we really run up the final limits to growth. We see that we're destroying the biosphere is already underway and we're destroying the foundations of life. And we see what we sought so diligently, uh, a materialistic uh, worldview and a uh, sense of success is not working. Uh, and it's only when pushed uh, to a place of just dire necessity uh, that period of the 2040s, the great sorrow, uh, that will either turn towards, uh, I think, probably authoritarianism, surrender to the two, giving up our freedoms and saying, save me uh, to an authoritarian uh, uh, bureaucracy and structure. We see the beginnings of that right now. The potential of that is already uh, here in our lives. We've been living through that potential the last uh, few years. So, when we get to that place of sorrow, the final letting go of the paradigm of the past, we can then open ourselves finally as a species, not just as individuals, but as a species and say, what are we doing here? And that's where we turn then from uh, the deadness of a, of a materialistic sense of the universe to the aliveness of the kind of world, the kind of universe that we've been speaking about here. And in a way, it's a return to our uh, original understanding of the nature of the universe. It's alive, it's a living system. The indigenous cultures speak of that, about that continuously. They may have different languages uh, for that. Um, instead of consciousness in the universe, they may say, well, there's a great wind that blows through the universe and that animates everything that exists. Well, that's consciousness and a, and a flow of aliveness. So my sense is, we're going to unravel the universe, the, the world that we have, so we can enter this new universe of aliveness that we're speaking about uh, right now. And the paradigm of the past, the paradigm that actually is dominant in the world today is that of a, a material universe. And we're material beings in that material universe. And if everything is essentially material and dead at the foundations, well then uh, exploit that which is dead for we that are alive. So exploitation comes immediately out of a sense of a non-living universe at the foundation in a material sense of structures. And so we want to reach for that which we think is most important, the material dimensions, uh, because we don't know there's more than that. But uh, ultimately, what we see uh, in these three scenarios, the third one of transition, is that uh, we find, well, at the foundations, we go back to the original insight, the original uh, understanding that it's a larger aliveness that we live uh, within and we can grow within that. Uh, we can grow our body of light, love, music, and knowing. We can connect with others who are doing the same. We can appreciate the architecture and aliveness in the, in the living universe. And we're then off on a new journey. Now, there's another way of, of seeing this that I think is very helpful. And it's, it's to say that humanity is growing up. I've been going around uh, the world for 30, 40 years now giving talks. And I will often ask one question before beginning a talk. I'll say, before I say anything, let me ask you a question. Uh, and a couple of thousand people are there and they're saying, well, uh, what I, I came here to be entertained, not to be in, 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 you know, interrogated. But the question is this, if you look at the entire human family and uh, 
look at the life stage of the human family and I give you four possibilities. Where are we? Are we behaving like toddlers, teenagers, adults, or elders? Toddlers, teenagers, adults, or elders. And I, I say, take one minute, think about this, talk to your neighbor, and then we're going to take a vote. And so uh, people are stunned that I would ask such, such a question. It's silence for about five seconds and it explodes in the conversation because everyone says, well, I know the answer to that question. And uh, the, the, the conversation goes for a minute or so. And then I'll say, okay, let's take a vote. Where are we uh, on this scale? Are we behaving like toddlers? And uh, not only raise your hands, but how about standing up for that? And I'll say, well, take a stand. And in an audience of several thousand people, there'll be a sprinkling of maybe 5% will stand up and say, yeah, we're behaving like toddlers. And I'll say, okay, how many would vote that we're behaving like teenagers? And with that, often, two thirds, three quarters, the audience stands up and they are stunned because I haven't said anything at that point. All they're doing is representing their own view of how we're behaving as a species. And there, I say, you can forget. And I will say here, don't forget how you came together this day and voted uh, by standing up for your point of view that yes, we're in our adolescence as a species. Now, what happens when we go from our adolescence to an, or to an early adulthood? We go from, a, well, it's about me, me, mine, how I'm seeing the image I have and so on. And then in our early adulthood, we start thinking about the other. Uh, we say a more, we bring a more compassionate regard to life. Uh, the, the adult says, well, before looking out after myself, maybe my children, maybe my family, maybe my community, and so on. That's uh, the maturation into early adulthood. So if we simply do that, and we know that, uh, what that's about. We've lived through that ourselves. If we begin to move into our early adulthood as a human family, it will bring a new level of regard and care and understanding to the totality of life on this planet. And I think that is found what is at the foundation of moving into this time of great, transi great transition. It is a new consciousness. It's the consciousness of maturation, adulthood, and that kind of uh, more compassionate knowing and regard that we bring to the world. But it's, it's a consciousness and an understanding that we already know but we're working to bring that um, into the world. So then that is uh, the evolutionary journey uh, simply stated. Comments? Hi, Duane, it's Annie again. Um, Hi, would Annie. you rather than, it sounds like we'd have to kind of be brought to our knees before this transformation hits. And there's a more awareness about interconnectivity and a reverence for nature and each other. Is there any way to ameliorate that in your mind and heart? Do you see a way of softening that? You know, I have children, a lot of us do. We think about their lives ahead and, uh, and other children, you know, the species basically. Um, do, you, do you have suggestions about how we can soften this sort of very hard lesson that might be coming our way? Well, I do. Um... So there are many answers, obviously, uh, to that, uh, Annie. Um, I think one of the key answers has to do with media, uh, because media. the mass media is the vehicle of collective consciousness, and seldom do we hear that. Um, often people feel that, well, the mass media is driving us into another evolutionary direction. It's not awakening us, it's, it's uh, consuming us with violence and uh, trivial uh, concerns and so on. Um, but if we begin to say, well, you know, um, the mass media is a, a, an expression of the mass mind. And if we begin to evolve the mass media, we will be literally evolving the mass mind. And currently, uh, I've done a lot of uh, community organizing around media. And I learned early on that broadcast television, for example, has an aphorism they use every day. And it is that if it bleeds, it leads. 
If it bleeds, it leads. If there's blood, we're going to show it first thing up. And that blood is going to draw people in. Uh, and then we will give them some ads. And then we'll maybe have some more blood and attention. And then we're going to give them some more ads. And so we are progressively uh, diminishing our, our, our capacities as a species by the very way in which we use the mass media. And uh, it's stunning to think about how the extent of which we are in a cultural trance. In the United States, the average person watches nearly four hours of television a day, four hours a day. <clears throat> and that means that as a society, we watch roughly a little more than a billion person hours a day of television, a billion person hours a day. And if that is driven by if it bleeds, it leads mindset, we are contracting our consciousness. We're not expanding and opening and uh, becoming more uh, compassionate in our considerations of the world. We're, it's becoming more contracted. So if you want to take one thing, uh, it would be to evolve how we use the mass media to use it as a tool of expansion expanding our sense of appreciation, uh, the architecture of the universe, the, the compassionate regard for other uh, beings, not just other people, but the rest of life, plant and animal, both. Uh, so they're immediately, if we would begin to change how we use the mass media, we're touching the lives of, of uh, in effect, a billion person hours a day worth of uh, programming is going to become dehypnotized and awakened into another way of regarding reality. So there's a lot that we can do, but that's just one powerful example uh, of what we can do. I, I think, for, for example, we need uh, I've, an earth voice movement. The earth does not have a voice, uh, but we do have a mass media. I, I say to people, look, Here's my cell phone. 60% uh, of the people on this planet have access to one of these right now. By the end of the decade, it will be 75%. And so if we wanted, we have the technology, the tools to begin communicating with ourselves, begin informing ourselves, awakening ourselves with a new window onto the world that's, that's afforded either through television, through the internet, uh, to see how we see ourselves as well as the world uh, out there. So there's one example. Thank you. Can I, can I be heard? I've been having microphone problems. I can? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Um, Dwayne, I wonder if you'd comment on um, the role of uh, spiritual technologies in all this. Um, it, it seems to me, uh, in my experience, the, the methodologies, the contemplative, meditative, uh, and uh, other disciplines that have come to us um, have the capacity, when they work well, to... Uh, to transform consciousness uh, from the inside. That is, uh, people gain a, a, a greater capacity to appreciate the wholeness and to appreciate and directly perceive the interconnectedness that um, you seek and we all seek to persuade people exist. And so there's the, the sort of approaching it from the outer dimension of changing media, changing what people know, what people hear, what people learn. And then there's the, the question of um, transforming people from the inside so they can greater comprehend and appreciate these things. Could you, could you comment on, on that sort of interaction? Well, sure. Um, I really uh, was catapulted into this um, evolutionary journey for myself um, based upon decades of meditation. But in 1977, 78, um, after years of meditation, I finally 
said, okay, I understand how this technology works, but I'm not really applying it in depth to myself. Uh, I'll go to a meditation retreat and sit in contemplation for an hour. They ring the bell and that's it, and it's done. Uh, now I walk around and then they ring a bell. Okay, and now we go to something else. So uh, the technology is broken. Uh, it, it's segmented. It, it doesn't have the continuity that's required to go really deep. So in um, 1977, I resolved, well, I'll, I know the nature of the inner inquiry. I'll do a solo retreat for a half year and see where that will lead me. And um, <clears throat> So, uh, after a half year, uh, just summarize, summarizing, after a half year, I, I had high hopes that I would be, uh, you know, really awakened in a powerful way. And I found what in, instead I was just more confused and compressed and than ever before. I had more ideas and thoughts and, and insights and this and that. And it wasn't an integrative whole. So I described in my book, Awakening Earth, that it's on my um, the journey. Uh, and at the end of that half year, I decided uh, this, I need to just sit in meditation until this resolves itself. Um, and so I began. And uh, essentially, I, I described there briefly in, in my book um, what happened over a period of three days of continuous uh, meditation. Uh, I had time in the laboratory with parapsychology. I knew, uh, I trusted uh, the nature of my uh, connection with the universe and with myself. Uh, so I said, I'll just sit with this as a continuous thread, a continuous flow, unbroken, no bell, no, no going away. I'll just sit with this until there's resolution that's offered by the universe. Uh, I was surrendered. I, I was at the end of my uh, rope of um, uh, grasping at uh, you know, understanding. And at the end of three days, um, much to my amazement, the, uh, the astonishing awareness emerged. Uh, the power of now, the power of now is because the universe is emerging as a self-consistent whole at every moment. It's flowing through us. And so uh, basically, I just came to where I already was, uh, a being in a living universe with the universe emerging moment by moment, uh, essentially the speed of light flowing through me. And uh, that flow naturally reorganized all the confusion and complexity that I was feeling into uh, the being that I've been ever since. So every day since May 3rd, 1978, I wake up with that knowing um, just embedded in my in the deepest core, the deepest structures of my being, and not just in the physical structures, but in the essence um, that we've been speaking about as a body of light, love, music, and knowing that is there. And so um, that's just one example of how sincere and deep uh, attention and then surrender to the uh, aliveness of a living universe in its regenerative flow will teach us. It's like saying me saying to the universe, well, surprise me. Well, teach me. Uh, I, I don't know how to teach me. And so, yes, the universe is here to uh, teach us if we will simply give ourselves to that uh, deep uh, journey. So there's one example. Um, could I comment on that, Dwayne? Um, well, go, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, how long will you need? How long what? John, how long will you need? Oh, just one second. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and then I'll go. Okay. Um, you, your experience was, was beautiful, um, Dwayne. Um, I just wanted to comment on what Phil said because I was about to ask something along that line. And probably most of us are old enough to have seen that movie with Dustin Hoffman, Little Big Man. And when the 
Calvary or massacre in the tribe that he's been adopted by, if you recall, he turns to the Indian chief who was played by Chief Dan George, who lives near where I live here in Canada. And I forget the words, but it's something like, how could my people do this to, to your people? And the Chief Dan George said, the difference between the Indian and the white is that the Indian sees life in everything and whites only see life in other whites. And the reason I'm bringing it up is I think what Phil was, was getting at is, um, you know, we probably all have many friends, I do, who are deeply in the activist movement and very well-meaning. Rick and I have discussed this many times. And whether, as Phil said, it's, it's kind of like hacking away at the iceberg with a pickass being a, an activist, whereas if you just raise the temperature to 32 degrees, the whole iceberg melts and therefore the emphasis should be on teaching people practices that raise their level of consciousness and dissolve all the negativity and stress that causes their vision to be crowded, clouded. Great, thank you, John. I agree. <laughs> well, I'd like to take us in a very different direction and forgive me for harping but um, twice, 12 years apart, Edgar Cayce said, um, the hope of the world will come out of Russia. Russia, yes, folks, Russia. And I was never into him, but he's right. The hope of the world is coming out of Russia. And it's going to take more than consciousness. And what's happening, 25 years after he died, a young girl was born to a reclusive couple in the northern boreal forest of um, Siberia. And she was in the line of one of the original priests in ancient Egypt who began controlling the world uh, in the negative way. And um, 25 years after she was born, this uh, kind of clueless entrepreneur encountered her and started writing books about her. And he ended up writing 10 books. And as a result of those books, tens of millions of people have been very trans uh, significantly transformed. Their lives have been totally transformed. But far more importantly, and this is the key, I really believe it's more than just consciousness. Hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people by now, mostly in the ex-Soviet countries, but also throughout the world, are returning to the earth. They're bonding with the earth. They're rooting in the earth. They're finding their own homeland, their own sacred space of two and a half acres of land. And they're turning them into gardens of Eden, not just farms where they grow food for money, but true gardens of Eden, where there's a little forest, there are orchards, there are over 300 perennials growing all different kinds of food and herbs. And they're doing it in eco communities, talking about community, um, <clears throat> where scores or over 100 families are living in one large oasis of life, creating a pristine environment, co creating with nature and God and the earth and you know bonding with uh, with earth themselves and each other in a way that no one else can because we all live separately and they are helping the ecology more than anything else on the planet right now and again this is mostly in the ex-soviet countries but it's also happening all throughout the world and this uh this returning to earth and bonding with earth and creating gardens of Eden in earth, your own homestead, your own homeland, connected to the homeland of you know, hundreds of other families is gonna end up doing more than all of our talk and all of our consciousness raising and, and all of our, you know, everything else put together, at least in my world, I believe that. So I just wanted to share that in case one person here maybe got interested. Great, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Mark um, is talking about the um, the Ringing Cedars series, Anastasia books. That's what he's referring uh, to here. Okay, good. Okay, I I really resonate with what you were saying, Mark, about um, 
connecting with the earth at a community level. And for many people, increasingly, the unit of survival and surpassing ourselves is the community. Um, it's not so much individual, but rather in community with others uh, that we find uh, the gardens, the homes, uh, the maturation of aliveness and such that, um, that can flourish. And that is very congruent with my book, uh, Choosing Earth. Uh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> so I feel very uh, much in alignment. I'm not so much thinking of Russia. I'm thinking about the entire planet and people around the earth, choosing earth uh, together, uh, but, but inspired by all of these examples that are now emerging around the earth of communities of consciousness and culture um, that are beginning to ex just flourish in the context of the breakdown, the unraveling uh, of the rest of, of the larger uh, world. So, yes. So, uh, how much time do we then? We have about 15 minutes left. 15 minutes. So, let's take uh, time now for um, further conversation, discussion, questions, whatever. Um, I'm open. If I, if I may add, first of all, I want to say this is a fascinating discussion and thank you, Dwayne, for what you've been presenting. I want to, uh, Mark's uh, comment is somewhat along the lines, related at least to what I was thinking, which is that your reflection on our shifting from an adolescent to adult uh, world, um, when I think about what it is that indigenous cultures they, they do when an adolescent is shifting into an adult uh, role, it's usually a rite of passage in nature. It's not a totally, and they, they certainly um, have a sense of what they would call the great spirit or the unity of all things. But there's the importance of the human to relating to the multiplicity and the beauty of the natural world and honoring their place in that, that seems to be so important. And I think um, the tension between uh, inner focused work, as important as it is, as being the, the, the thing that will bring about the shift in consciousness and bring not only consciousness, but a shift in the world and outer focus, the focus on what it is that's happening in the world. And is it possible, and I, I just ask your reflections on this, that very often the focus on totally spiritual practice uh, and the oneness and the non-duality can be an avoidance of the pain that one would experience if they really paid attention to what's going on in the world, what's really happening to the earth, to the species, to humanity. Um, that's my question. Great. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, many thoughts. I, I'd like to focus on one though, about the uh, what you said about indigenous cultures having a rite of passage uh, for young people as they grow into their maturity become a mature member of the larger tribe. And here we are as a species going into this time of unraveling uh, and, and collapse and, and great sorrow as well. And I think that is our rite of passage. And it takes us beyond, let's say, a spiritual um, uh, bypassing and avoidance and takes us into, we cannot avoid the suffering and the sorrow that's descending upon the earth right now. And that I think is going to just break us open. The sorrow will break us open into grieving and in the grieving, we will, uh, we will enlarge our sphere of uh, connection and communion with, with the totality of life. And that in turn is the rite of passage. I think that's essential for humanity as a whole, not just collection here and there around the earth, but as a whole species for us to move uh, from our adolescence as a species and into our early adulthood. So I think you put your finger on a key 
uh, element of that transition, that transformation, that rite of passage. Can I, I agree up? with. Can I just follow up real quick? Sure. That is, that is that it, it would only be a rite of passage if we saw it as that. If one consciously moved through this sorrow and grief and pain. Um, and it seems to me that as spiritual teachers, we have an important role to play in helping people, guiding people to that engagement, that engagement with the world as it is and focusing attention on that, as well as the focus on perhaps what we could call the more vertical, the more inward. Right. Yes, I agree, Alan. The, uh, the vertical, the co-arising, the, the miracle of the now, uh, the emergence of a living universe, the first miracle meets then the horizontal dimension of life uh, on the ground. And where those two meet is transformative. So yes, I agree. Thank you, Alan. I agree completely with what Alan and you both have said, Duane, about the fundamental nature, the very fundamental nature of uh, internal change and focus on that as being the only real solution for the world's issues. And as a person who has taught for 45 years, this is the, my focus and how I try to bring it to others and how I try to maintain it. At, in my own practice. At the same time, I wanna contrast the fundamental issues, which again, I think are fundamental, the only real solution with critical issues, which are facing us right now. Um, some of the topics that we were talking about for this session were the existential threats that the world faces. And these are not long-term threats. These are near-term threats. With the collapse of the ice shelves, um, the uh, increasing, uh, you know, this breakdown of biodiversity, um, climate change, um, refugee movement that is increasing with all of this, uh, increasing so uh, saber rattling between the nuclear armed nation, all of these things that I'm sure you're very well aware. Of. These things are coming to a head in the next 10, 12 years. And as you point out, uh, there's a critical time coming in probably something like the mid 2030s. Um, transformational change for the world will not take place in that time. Somehow or another, um, the, the power centers of the earth, which are largely the nations and increasingly large corporations, these are the things that have to be moved in some way in order to avert these near-term uh, crises. And it seems, and again, I participate in this, it seems that the teaching community sort of cocoons itself within its own sangha, doing very valuable work, no, no question. And assuming that this will move outward in expanding um, waves, which it will and does, but not fast enough. In other words, if the house is on fire, you don't sit and meditate to put it out. If the car runs out of gas, you don't sit in the driver's seat and meditate for it to fill up you take action. And it seems like some sort of action needs to be taken. In the spiritual community, um, I'm not advocating that we all become activists out on the protest lines or running for office. Some may choose to do that, but I don't think as a group, we're all that qualified for it. I'm looking for something between those two poles, between simply focusing on the teaching practice that comes from the axial age and when there was no real communication with the world. And, and you bring up the media and that is kind of the bond between these two, but how we would take what we do have and know and put it into some form or forms. I have no idea what it is. This is not a, this is not a statement in the form of a question. Um, how we would take what we do have and know, the skills that we do have, and put them into some forms that could move these larger power centers, which is the only way these short-term crises are going to be solved. I, I toss that out there. Great. Um, well, I've come to my current view only very slowly and with great resistance. Um, because since the 70s, I've been 
hoping and looking for some kind of transformation, some kind of transition. I mean, if we can imagine it, experience it and so on, we can, we can realize it, we can bring it down to earth. And I've done a tremendous amount of community organizing, speaking in, or to corporations and governments and this and that. Um, and only reluctantly have I come to the view that um, Rick presented in those three uh, scenarios, uh, that we are going into a time of unraveling. And in the past, uh, the big corporations, the big governments have been holding us together into the current structures and forms that we live within. And I think those are unraveling. And um, I did not expect them to, to unravel to the degree that I now am now suggesting. But I think not only are they going to unravel, they're going to come apart. And uh, there's a sequence, if we had more time, we could speak about this, of... Um, the kind of forces that have been brought up here of uh, climate change leading to uh, mass migrations of people on that cre creating immense uh, disruption in the civic structures of life, uh, the inability of the corporate structures to uh, themselves hold together in when the financial structures uh, begin to unravel and dissolve, they're already showing the cracks of, of doing that. In other words, in a nutshell, I think we will see the dominant structures that have held our life together, the big corporations, the big governments, and so on, unravel. And then as they unravel, what we then find as the units of uh, creation and transformation are the smaller communities. And, that, and these small communities and a communications rich world can pull together and hold ourselves together at the very time that the larger structures that, that have held us into one configuration are breaking down. And then we can move from, let's say a nation state um, civilization for the earth to a true uh, culture and community of uh, consciousness and culture of the people of the earth. And uh, that doesn't mean we're going to get a, a, you know, eliminate all corporations and, and governments and so on, but rather they will be encapsulated in, in, in embodied within a larger body of life that is um, the conscious citizens of the earth coming together in a more mature way to say we hold uh, this consciousness and this regard for life. And we, we insist that the corporate structures, so on, the government structures begin to uh, behave in ways that respect those, those uh, spheres of life. And we begin to then to rebuild uh, the earth, re regenerate the earth uh, with, with that new consciousness and new regard. So, and that's a tough, uh, uh, path to go down. Uh, it's not one that I uh, that I hope for, but it's the one that I see un evolving uh, in front of us right now. So, uh, and it's a hard passage. It is a authentic rite of passage. If, as Alan was saying, we we will claim that uh, for ourselves. So, that's my quick view of things. David, thank you. And I appreciate your answer, and I'll just, you know, add one more piece to be thought of later, no. and that is, is there, a, are there middle strategies between those two? Hey, um, David, can I, can I speak to David uh, here? <laughs> um, um, you know, the crisis that you talk about, the emergency is very present, and if we're aware of it, it's clear. Right. But the issue is, uh, you know, why is it not clear enough for action? That's the question, right? Why is it not clear enough for action yeah. uh, among the leaders of the world, among the, the mm -hmm. individuals of the world? And to address that question, I don't see how we can get around addressing the human condition. In other words, the climate crisis and the human condition, the condition of separation and self 
interest and the, the self-interest that runs the corporations uh, and that runs the decision makers of the world, um, that we have to look at that human condition and the climate crisis together. They, they're, I don't see them as separate. I don't know about the spiritual alchemy of it all, but, but, but the human condition in the, in the environment and the climate crisis, I think need to be seen together. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll like to make a comment. I hope responds to Jeff as well as to David. Uh, David was asking about a middle path uh, so we don't have to go through utter demise. And uh, Jeff's looking at a, a more integrated view of all of this. It seems to me <clears throat> this goes to our social imagination and um, the power of media in many, many ways. Uh, we're becoming a globalized uh, world. Uh, we have just in an instant of geological, even political time, we've become a globalized world with the internet. And uh, there's a foundational understanding that I think needs to come into play here. And it is that uh, if we can imagine it, we don't have to enact it. If we can imagine what we're going through in, in the decades just ahead, and if we can visualize that with the mass media around the world, we don't have to enact that. If we can imagine, let's say we're driving that car and we're about to go over a cliff. If we can imagine what it's like to go over the cliff, we, we can put on the brakes. Uh, we can turn the wheel, steering wheel. We can move in another direction. Right now, we are not mobilizing our collective imagination to see what, what we're creating. And so many uh, leaders in business and government are distracted. They're saying, well, it's the bottom line right now. It's the next two years, and we're going to make a bunch of money in the next two years. Or the politicians are going to create a bunch of power for our political part of the political apparatus in the next few years. And we're not extending our social imagination into the further future. And as a consequence, we're having to enact where we're going in physical reality. So we have the tools, we have the consciousness, we have the capacity of collective imagination to say, well, I don't want to go into that time of great unraveling and great sorrow and so on. Uh, we see what is coming. So let's enact now collectively an alternative pathway ahead. And I think that capacity is critical for our uh, common future and for making a turn towards a path of great transition. There's, this is so much fun, Dwayne, and it's tempting to just keep it going on and on, but um, I guess we better be disciplined and, and stick to the hour and a half that we agreed upon. Um, there's some comments in the chat that we didn't get to and all, but we could easily go on another, another hour and a half, I think, and not run out of things to say. I think this has been one of our most interesting and lively webinars yet. Um, so... I'm really grateful to you for agreeing to do this on such short notice. And um, it's, you know, really been an honor to have you, have you with us today. It's been an honor to be with you and I've enjoyed it immensely. So thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you all to, from the ASI's perspective for, for joining us and sorry, we didn't get to all the people who wanted to ask questions and all. Um, we will, there will be some kind of, there'll be a record of this on um, the ASI website and we'll have links to Dwayne's um, websites. And uh, there's a much longer version of, of that video that you saw a clip from that you can watch. And uh, the whole thing is very much worth watching. So, um, and if you just if you just Google Dwayne's name or put it into YouTube, you'll see a bunch of talks he's given and, and so on. And, you know, you can delve more deeply into his work.